You're listening to the State of Startups with Industry Analysts. We shine a light on the interplay of startups, their ecosystem, and industry analysts in the B2B tech space. That is, real experiences from real people solving the same challenges that you're dealing with, too. You're hosted by Chris Holscher and Robin Schaefer. Enjoy this session. Hey, Robin. Good to see you again. How are you? Hey, Chris. I'm very relaxed after a fantastic holiday. And I'm very excited after some very fruitful business travel, too. So feeling great. How are you? Well, well first of all, I'm jealous <laughs> because I know that you went to Portugal. And, and that must be just so nice, oh, nice in spring. So nice in spring. And, and well, well, I've also recharged my batteries. Um, we recently did a short trip to the to the North Sea, and then the Baltic Sea, and um, it's been a lot of fresh air and a lot of sun for me. Um, nice. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So we both had a little break, and now we're back with a very interesting guest. True. True. Yes, we spoke to to John Collins, and um, John is one of the senior analysts with GigaOm. And he's their VP of research as well. And at GigaOM are really interesting, um, a really interesting analyst firm because they um, they started um, as a as a private blog um, that was run by Om Malik, hence the name GigaOM, and it became really influential um, in the space of emerging tech and startups, of course. And I believe back in 2015 or something, GigaOM got acquired by um, Knowingly, Knowingly Corp. They're called. Yeah. Um, after they had they have swallowed up a couple of other blogs and became bigger and bigger, so they then they got acquired by by Knowingly Corp. And they pivoted um, to becoming an analyst firm with with a strong um, engineering background. Right. And I'd say this entire history and the specific background makes both John and Gigaom super interesting for us to speak to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and John is not only one of their senior analysts who's worked at a startup himself, but he's also Ooh. someone with so much detailed expertise on one hand, and then he's so approachable and down to earth as well. Indeed, uh, John, John's, I, I would say he's the type of analyst character that you that you really want as your sort of extended brain power in in your organization um well but before we dive in um what stood out to you in this interview robin mm, well i think what i like best was his differentiation between the serial entrepreneur with lots of experience building companies versus a small team who are essentially like engineers maybe a marketeer who identified a problem, solved it, and now aim to take the solution to the market. Because there's a really big difference between these two. Yeah, I agree, agree. And th that was right at the beginning um, of the interview, right? Great point. Yeah. Um, I also also liked his take on the on the echo chamber and his examples with, with innovative technology that may be brilliant and, and still productizing it is not trivial. Um, and communicating it um, in a way that uh, the markets actually get it and and get the value and prioritize budget to it um, and all that. It, it, that's sometimes, um, well, that is something that, that many startups, right. in fact, even large companies struggle with all the time and, and it's just more difficult than they ever imagined it to be at the beginning. And I think that John shared some really good perspective on that too. Absolutely. So let's roll the tape. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Roll the tape. Love it. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Again, um, we are together um, again for this new episode of the C interview series. We have Robin Schaffer, as always, and a guest, uh, John Collins of GigaOM. Um, Good to have you on the show, John. We just actually just published a joint uh, paper on, on LinkedIn, a conversation that we recently had when you were in your campaign and I was sitting at my kitchen table and we accidentally recorded it and figured out, wow, this was a really good conversation. So let's take this a step deeper today. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about okay. the, um, to start us off. Okay, so, um, and 
feeding it back into the whole startup uh, element. So um, I've got a technical background. I used to work, I used to run IT systems, consult in uh, software development practice and IT management practice. Became an analyst a long time ago, then stopped being an analyst for a bit and uh, joined a joined a technical startup for a while. Did loads of other things as well, uh, and then came back came back to the game. Um, so. Uh, still like to keep my hand in. Uh, I think the interesting thing about GigArm as a company is uh, we're all engineering backgrounds or still actively consulting or whatever. So so it does mean that we're very much walking in the shoes of the people that are subscribing to to our research. So hopefully that keeps it real. Um, yeah, I, you know, so, so many analysts I think are in ivory, ivory towers. You know, they're thinking, they got good thoughts, but sounds like you guys are, are, are really in touch with what's, ha what's happening on the ground. I mean, there's a huge. It's always dangerous to kind of you know you don't you don't uh, uh, diss the competition, but but there's a huge um, difference I've found where it's very easy to kind of go philosoph philosophical or go marketing like kind of oh well that's the shape the shape of it it should look like this and actually you then go and speak to a CIO or you know an engineer or whatever and they go well sure that's the theory but in practice we're still dealing with X we're still dealing with Y I haven't got any money uh, it's it's uh, or you know. Um, uh, it's I'm firefighting every day. How do you expect me to prioritize this the way you've presented it? So it we need those slaps. You know, we need we need to kind of be knocked off our perch a bit. Um, and that sounds like really important. particularly relevant for you. I'm sure you work with all size organizations, but startups. It sounds like their life. You know, not just their technology strategy. And yeah, often startups. Um, they're, they're either founded, I mean, you know more about them than I do, uh, but they're, they're often founded by serial entrepreneurs or they're founded by people with a real bee in their bonnet about solving a problem. Um, and and certainly many of the newer, more exciting startups I think we've seen recently are the bee in the bonnet types. They're, they're, they're people with a kind of uh, struggling under, they'd be working for a big company, they'd be struggling under the weight of a lack of progress. They'd be going, oh, we need to sort this out. Why don't we? And and often then they'd create a uh, an internal project, and then they'd get excited about that, and then you know let's 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 make it broader. So so there's a real you can't just kind of go oh these these guys they don't know what they're talking about. They know exactly what they're talking about. They they're actually solving a, a very specific problem, mm -hmm. and our job isn't to tell them they're wrong. Our our job is to kind of help because the one thing they haven't necessarily done is grown a business. Uh, so uh, it, it's more that side of it, but. Analysts, as you know, that the job is to talk about the, the the tech and the market and so on. Uh, and I think sometimes we kind of assume we know more than the people that are solving the problems. Uh, so, so it's always worth it, it. It's worth talking to the startups just to learn. Never mind, um, you know, uh, the the um, the fact that we could work together. Well, Chris always talks about the echo chamber. Can you talk about that? About the value of startups because they're in an echo chamber. You well, know, and you've talked about how they're talking to themselves and they need that outside perspective. Oh, you mean me? I mean you, yeah. Oh, so, really? <laughs> okay. You, Chris, Chris, you've talked about that a lot and I thought that would be relevant to this conversation. Yes, indeed. Um, it's, it, I've seen this a lot of times that, uh, that startups, because they are so deep into their idea um, and they're talking with, you know, interested uh, clients or they're talking with interested partners, and once you know uh, they, they've reached a certain number of people that they can have shared their idea with, like I don't know if it's twenty or fifty or thirty or something, um, they feel like they've gotten enough validation of their thinking. Um, but really, even if you have spoken to like twenty uh, different companies or so, it is still only a fraction of what's out there. And um, and uh, then also uh, because these people, you know, tend to maybe want to have a business relationship with you of some sort. They will, um, you know, um, paint their conversation in in a certain way and and be a little bit tactical about it. And have what you, you really that, need John? as a, oh, sorry, what have what you, you really that, need John? as a, I was going to ask him. I was going to ask John if he's seen that kind of thing from the startups he's worked with. Um, I think that it's just really, really interesting. It's always really useful to know the provenance of a startup uh, because. Often the provenance will set how the startup is thinking about so solving a certain problem, uh, and that definitely plays into the echo chamber element of it. In that, so for example, um, there's a lot of companies at the moment uh, forming around. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of two areas now. I'm thinking of the DevOps world, and I'm thinking of the security world. 
-hmm. So the trouble with security professionals is that they think about security all the time. And therefore, there's a lot of great stuff coming out of the security world. A lot of, yeah, oh, we need to solve this problem. Absolutely, that problem needs to be solved. But they're not necessarily thinking about it from the point of view of non-security people. And outside of the security world, the problem is that people don't care. So it, it's it's a lot about, you, you can't just go, oh, we've got to solve this problem. You've got to actually frame it in a way that the the people outside security are actually going to care about it. Um, so, yeah, the seat, seat belts in cars, for example, um, uh, was that implemented through uh, by legal means? Was it implemented by marketing? Was it implemented? Uh, and it was a bit of a bit of everything, but it certainly wasn't implemented because people thought really hard about the fact they might have an accident if they didn't, because otherwise they'd be doing it anyway. So I, I think that's the, the the tricky bit with the echo chamber. And in the DevOps world, um, loads of very very smart, innovative people, mm. but often they're they're three steps ahead of where the real world is. Yeah. Um, and so they've created something that's going to be great at some point in the future but it's not necessarily great now uh so again it's it's just about um repositioning thinking in the broader context which is sounds like i'm stating the obvious but you know when you when you go to uh i remember actually if i may very quick digression uh when i was a business analyst uh we thought we knew what the business processes were of an organization uh -huh. but then you go and sit down with the lady in accounts the the you know the the IT, yeah, the, the finance director, and then they actually explain what, why those things are like they are, and sometimes they're stupid for a really good reason. <laughs> and so it, the echo chat, the, the kind of what you're talking about, the, the when you're separated from that stuff, you're not necessarily aware of why the priorities are being set the way they are, and sometimes it's for a really, really good reason. That once you got it, you go, oh, yeah, right, fair enough. Now we need to work with that. It, it just broadens the the size of the system that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the other angle that I find quite often true to, to that um, echo chamber question is that um, since many startups are, are really deep into solving, as you say, solving their problem, but they're not necessarily as deep into um, the, the, mar the actual market size of the, uh, the, uh, that problem. So um, it's always, you know, technology push and solution push. And then also there is market pull. And um, I feel what, what analysts can really help with is bring that market in perspective into the startup and help them validate their thinking, help them maybe even discover new angles to possibilities of positioning their, their idea and all that. So um, taking risk out of the whole um, um, phase, as well as opening up new channels, new, new possibilities that they haven't even thought of, um, because that perspective just was lacking. And that, that's not just startups, right? I think that's any... Uh, organization that's, that that thinks a bit too long about anything. Um, so often we'll get hit with, uh, oh, we've got this great new product and we've spent ages defining the tagline. What do you think of it? I'm like, you know, don't care. It, yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> sure, whatever. But it, it, it's, I think one of the great things that analysts bring is they're kind of very tactically focused consultants, if you like. They're, they're like arrowheads. You can just kind of throw, you know, throw them like a dart. Um, to um, you know, have a very short advisory session and just go, ah, right, I get it. We've been thinking about this far too much, far too hard, and we've kind of gone off in a certain direction. It's a bit like when you're cooking and you start using all the spices and you don't yeah, yeah, yeah. taste of anything anymore. You just need someone else to stick their finger in there. Yeah, too salty. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks. You know, a client, a client of mine has actually articulated this really nicely, and they said and we only just had the you know introductory briefings at the time. And even by then, when it was like 90% of the client speaking to the analyst and just getting something like 10% of feedback and questions back, even after that, he um, he said, you know what, these conversations help us, already help us make bolder decisions faster. Because it just takes out questions um, from, from our, you know, from where we are and, and helps us um, uh, not go down all these different rabbit holes through A-B testing, uh, which is mm. really time consuming. And it's just mm. very helpful. Yeah, yeah. I said I, I just wanted to dig on something about um, when you were saying they've got an idea and the market's not not they're ahead of the market, right? You were saying that you see that frequently because I think mm. that's that, that's true with with startups. But it's also true. I've worked with large companies, and what we've always dealt with, and I'm curious your perspective, is why don't you show thought leadership to an analyst? And that requires you to be thinking, to have vision, to be ahead of the market. And then the analyst asks for a customer example. And there's no customer example yet, because if you're truly thinking ahead of the market, customers aren't doing it yet. 
And that's sort of a conundrum I have found with working with analysts. Have you had that experience? Um, the, the standard analyst answer is it, it depends. It, depends. it kind of partially. Uh, uh, the, the be in their bonnet um, startups, uh, I think something we can all do is when we've seen a problem exists, we believe it exists everywhere. And when we've defined a solution to a problem, we believe everyone needs it. And that may or may not be true, but it's only you're only going to be able to know whether it's true by finding out. Uh, and that can be through passive marketing, you know, classic, traditional, just go out and ask people. Uh, but to your point, the sometimes in, in this world of digital transformation and everything else, you can lull yourself into a place that says, ah, oh, that's just because they don't get it yet. Um, yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, it's a Venn diagram. You know, you, you've, you've got to be bringing something that the market needs today. Uh, it may be that um, the, the, the elevator pitch, it, it, it may be that it, you can't explain it very well, in which case people don't get it, in which case you need to explain it better. And so you need, you need to work on your pitch, not just yeah. because it's a cool thing to do, but if you can't explain it properly, then that's probably because it probably. can't be explained properly until such time as you can. So that, that that's on you. Um, that I mean, I'm thinking about areas like you know, microservices and containers and, and so on okay. and so forth. So th there's a there's been a general move towards container based architectures for applications, mm -hmm. uh, and that's where they're useful. That's generally a good thing. But if you come up to someone and say, oh, you need to containerize everything, and then you're going to need our backup solution. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> just, just run that one past me again. So, so it, it's, it, it's about meeting people where they are. I was just yeah. speaking to a vendor yesterday, and they said they deliberately put things into their product, which is a kind of management tool that enabled uh, the organization, the target organization to define themselves as they are, rather than telling them, you've got to get with our program. You're wrong as you are. Uh, your, your whole setup should look like this and then you'll be better off. So, so that you know, they're solving it by meeting the customer where yeah. they're actually existing. Yeah. yeah. But also showing them, you know, a lot of times success is showing them here's where you are today and we're going to bring it to the future and have some faith and confidence that this, that this uh, vendor, this startup knows where it's going and we're going to take you there. Yeah. Um, I have a question there uh, because one thing that I see quite frequently is that startups sometimes are afraid to reach out to an analyst before they think they've got everything perfect. Yes. And um, so the, the question to that then would be, when would you recommend actually startup should start engaging with, with analysts? What's, I mean, there's always... What would be the indicator for them to say, well, let's, let's start this now? What I'd like to see as part of a dynamic ecosystem is that we were talking anyway. Um, so the, the best, the people I speak to again and again are the ones that I've spoken to for 20 years. And it's never too early to start that 20 year process of just having a relationship. You know, someone, can I just pick your brains kind of, kind of thing? I'm thinking of uh, building this stuff up. It seems to be you know, a real kind of clear need. I'm not really sure. Someone could literally ask me, and I, and I say to people, anyone out there that just wants to say, Hey, John, I've got this idea. What do you think? So wow. there is, there isn't a too early. Uh, for, for even a back of a napkin plan, you know, is, is it will work for now. Uh, absolutely. And, and that's a great, um, I mean, obviously if I suddenly got a thousand requests like that, then I'd probably start to feel a bit buried, but it doesn't happen that way. It, it is kind of, you know, the one-off things in terms of actually getting advisory, uh, that's when probably the startup itself is starting to formalize more. So I, I think there's always room for informal uh, interaction uh, as things formalize then it's down to why you know, why do you need to speak to us uh, and the why often has a, a, a kind of price tag on it because if you want to speak to us so you can decide which new markets to go into uh, well you're going to make money out of that so you know um, there's there's th yeah. some things that we can't give away for free but um, overall I, I'd say have the dialogue first and then um, see, see which bits of advice cost and which bits don't because a lot of it is just about talking and then there is the, the follow-up question of course um you know startups especially when they're really innov innovative about what they're doing um 
you know, being being afraid to share something that um, they feel really needs a non-disclosure agreement or something. Um, how 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 do you how do you see this? Well, for for start, there's the gentleman's agreement, gentlepersons agreement that analysts have. Uh, you know, the only time I can ever remember an analyst breaching a an informal NDA, no one spoke to them for five years. So it's it's literally. Um, uh, that there, there has to be trust within within the analyst community. But the other thing, and I've spoken to organizations, uh, when you've suddenly come up with some fantastic IP that you think back to, you think you're the only person in the world that's ever solved that problem. You think everyone needs a solution to that problem. You also then get very paranoid about uh, telling people that you found this great solution to it uh, because you think everyone's going to steal it because yeah. it's such a good idea. But actually what you're forgetting is chaos, complexity, reality. Yeah, uh, if you've got a great idea for a novel and you put it out there, that doesn't mean that 20 people are going to go, what a great idea, and then write the novel before you do. Ain't going to happen. Everyone's too busy. So I, I, I think there are uh, checks and balances for this. I mean, if you suddenly came up with um, you know, nuclear fission and um, and it actually worked, uh, then yeah, keep, keep that one to yourself um, <laughs> uh, until you've got a whole patent on it. But in general, I, I think the risk is relatively low. Yeah, and I think the thing just to just to reiterate is that unlike the media and journalists, analysts are not looking for the scoop, and they're looking Absolutely. to understand. And it's a different thing. And I think people are not understanding that distinction enough to open up to an analyst. And that's uh, just a, a gap I see. And 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 let's 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 pull that apart a little bit because I see that a lot. I'm sure I'm sure you do as well. That the the difference between analyst relations and public press relations, uh, PR, and, and general comms. Uh, analysts don't exist in order to find stuff out and tell the world about it. Um, we, we're, we're kind of characterized as influencers in uh, in a lot of ways. And therefore, you know, and with the whole Instagram thing, uh, it, you know, I really need to up my game, obviously. Uh, but uh, it's that's only one part of um, of what analysts can bring, particularly for startups. I think the, the whole analyst industry was predicated on you know, influencing the buying decision, uh, but that was when it was multi-million uh, database management deals. You know, back in the nineties, and yeah, you know, SAP and Oracle and, and Sun and all these you know, huge acquisitions. Uh, these days, when it's a, a land and expand model, or um, uh, you know, where, where your, your freemium models for 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 um, an, an open source and so on and so forth. Um, what analysts are essentially bringing are we speak to so many organizations that by the nature of all those conversations we're learning a lot of things that we can then impart the the, the kind of distilled version of the, which we call insight but i yeah. i think i i don't i wouldn't overstate the role of analysts uh from the point of view of uh it's not some ivory tower i mean it can be seen that way but it is people that just have the time to learn yeah. Yeah. And we bring that learning back. So I would, I would, I would lead with that. You know, journalists have a very different role. Their their job is to tell people things. Right. Our job is to learn things and then feedback. Great way to put it. Um, and there is a really um, subtle, but I believe very um, powerful distinction between self-identifying as an influencer and just the fact that through what you're doing, being very influential as a side effect. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that is a major distinction between yeah. something people call influencer relations or analyst relations. You know, um, an influencer, I identify as give me your money and I'll say nice things about you. Um, whereas I'm pretty sure that is not very, um, analysts would not be very happy with that notion. I mean, where do I sign? Sounds great. You know, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been uh, fooled by those things in my, in my life. I'll do anything for a pair of socks. I think you know that, that's that's public knowledge. Um, yeah, my favorite socks at the moment are from Delphix. You know, they've got such a good logo. Works brilliantly. I'll, yeah. So Delphix. Yeah, absolutely best products in the world. Actually, actually, that's Robin. That isn't what isn't that how we got him on the show, right? I think so. Those socks were great. They really were. <laughs> yeah. No. And, and it's again the the business model would very quickly crumble. That we have to be very careful as an industry to um, not be pay for play. And that is yes. that is the big reputation. So uh, two ways of interpreting that remark. One is uh, we're only going to write about you if you give us money. The second is we will write nice things about you if you give us money and or you know have awards systems or, or whatever. And uh, I think some analyst firms in the past and probably now I've, I've not been doing a survey, but uh, uh, 
have been or can be guilty of, of kind of yeah. steering in that direction. So at Gigarm, I know we have a lot of focus on defensibility. I can have a very strong opinion that a company is great, but I need to say why. Um, so as long as we've got that, uh, and it's not just, oh, observability is a, a really complex space, and therefore you need products from so-and-so, that, that doesn't that doesn't work. Uh, and we very quickly, um, our brand would very quickly dilute if your, we went down fact, that track. Your, your, your reputation and the trust that the market has in you would just dissipate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. John, as you just casually mentioned the company that you're working for, Gigaon, I, mm. I realized at the beginning of this session, we jumped immediately into the startup analyst relations, you know, mm -hmm. uh, conversation, and we completely forgot to tell our our audience, you know, about about your company, what you're doing, what you're specializing, mm -hmm. so that people can um, put you in, you know, have some orientation. T tell well, us a little bit about um, about Giga and where you're specializing in. And let let me put it in that context then. So so essentially, we we cover um, 120 technology categories every year. Um, and uh, our main focus is engineering-led evaluation. So we have uh, uh, two key reports. One's called the Key Criteria Report, which essentially maps onto a, an RFP. It's like, here's the requirements that any product in the space needs to have. And then we have a radar report, which is, um, okay, we went out to find all the vendors we could that kind of went, that jumped through the mandatory hoops of that, that RFP, what we call the table stakes. And this, this is what we found out. So um, it's, very engineering led from the point of view of we try to work as much as possible with people that have actually deployed those technologies, similar technologies, et cetera. So our, our DevOps report analyst writers are uh, people that have you know, been developers currently doing value stream mapping, uh, delivering CICD tool chains, whatever. Our security people, our security consultants, our networking people, our network engineers, uh, and, and so on. So, um, I mean, that does make for challenges back to this influencer thing, because uh, we you know, we'd say to one of our network engineer uh, report writers, All right, you need to get on LinkedIn. You need to kind of show her just how, you know, um, you need to wave your arms around. He's like, why do I want to do that? I'm an engineer. You know, so uh, we kind of struggle in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. that, uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, and then people come to us and say, yeah, we don't see, you're not on our radar because you're not, uh, there's, there's various statistics uh, for the startups out there. There's various statistics that PR companies use, like how many times are people quoted in the press? How many, um, uh, yeah, how many LinkedIn posts have they done? How many mentions of my company have been in what they've said? That kind of stuff. We're not very good at that. Uh, so, uh, um, but we we are good at engineering. Um, and I think from the the startup perspective, the the way that I just described the reports, if your company does uh, fulfill the set of table stakes for a given area that we're we're researching, you'll be in the report if we can get yeah. you in the report. I mean, sometimes an area like um, uh security vulnerability scanning um there's like 50 60 vendors in that space and we have to draw a line somewhere we've just spent the whole year just researching that so i think we cut it off you've got to have a certain volume of customers etc cetera, etc cetera. yep uh, but again we'll be we'll try to be defensible on that so we'll um and we do get pushed back people say oh you should have included us we're the most popular blah 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 um and we, we yeah we take we take those and and take that feedback and, and deal with it yeah uh, in engineering perspective, I, I don't see that a lot. So it's very, very interesting. I mean, I guess there's the question of what is an analyst firm anyway, uh, which uh, I I always go to, back to, we analyze things so other people don't have to. Um, but most analysts, I'd say, are market analysts. Uh, so they either do the kind of the shape of the market from a mm -hmm. uh, qualitative perspective, or they do the shape of the market from a quantitative perspective. Uh, and we're doing it more from a um, capability perspective. Yeah. So yeah. I know there's, you know, if you read uh, Forrester's key capabilities reports, is it Forrester that do that one? Or is it Gartner or Forrester? But they, there are reports like that. So don't get me wrong. Yeah, there's some very smart people in other analyst firms. Yeah. But I think we're the ones that you'd probably want, you know, post deployment or during, you know, dur before, during, and post deployment to, yeah. to actually have something that's going to work. Yeah. Wait. So. It's been a, a, it's been really really interesting. Um, so, what advice would you give startups um, or their VC accelerators, you know, to to work with analysts? Is there any particular advice you would give them? Um, and thinking. Just start. I think that would be that would be my first advice. Don't feel that you've got to kind of. Uh, you're probably smarter than the analysts you're speaking to. Right. Um, but the pro the so but the challenge you've got is that you're you're in your own echo chamber. So so recognize the value that analysts can bring you that they're they're seeing it from a, a more 
a broader perspective. So that 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 will be valuable to you. Uh, so just start and um, start understanding the the nature of the analyst uh, industry and how it can be useful to you. So um, if you can get access to analyst reports, read them uh, yeah. and understand that uh, different analysts bring different things to different personas um, and then work with firms. It, it, it may be that you're a, a company that needs to know the data side of things. So yeah, work with a company that does the stats or you may need to uh, you may need to have the thought leadership understanding in which case look at that side of things or you may need you know, the engineering perspective we bring but um don't see them as a kind of you, know, um, you can't see my hand over there uh, a kind of a wall of uh, the same things that it, it's horses for courses uh, yeah. um speaking of analyst firms so uh, uh it you'll get a picture of what you need and, and how you can get value out of it that's great that's good advice that's i think that that's um nails once more that um you know you, you could have answered look for the most influential report in your in your in your area in your segment and make sure that you get onto this report which is what many people think as the number one answer mm -hmm. and um we haven't obviously not scripted this <laughs> i mean otherwise i wouldn't stumble with words but um i'll throw something else in then um oh. the um we work within a sphere of marketing and my firm belief is that if you look at all the different roles in a company marketing is very important but it's the least important it's not as important as product development it's not as important as sales it's not as important as finance uh, and probably not as important as hr because that's organizing the people around actually delivering the thing but marketing serves a really important purpose but actually the role marketing exists in an echo chamber of its own and if you if you remain inside that Yes. Uh, it does all become about influence. The best value you can get out of analysts is increasing sales. If you're a vendor, if you're a startup vendor. So I'd be looking at it from a sales enablement perspective rather than from a marketing influence perspective. Because influence without enablement, it's uh, it's throwing a ball over a wall and hoping that someone's there to catch it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I found that too. You know what? I want to challenge that a little bit because I was lucky to have a fantastic professor uh, back in university who um, explained or made sure that every one of their students understood that marketing is not advertising and it's not communications, that marketing um, has a big portion to it that uh, makes strategic decisions about how do we work our market? So where do we find white space? How do we want to explain ourselves? How do we want to differentiate against our, um, you know, our, our peers and our worthy rivals? And, and that, so, um, if I believe if we come from that perspective of understanding marketing as an essential, you know, corporate development function, not yep. just getting the message out there, then the whole equation changes fundamentally. I agree with you. Uh, and I will caveat what I said before uh, by actually when you're understanding where your product fits and how to kind of. Uh, make sure that your product is being developed in the right way with the right features, et cetera, et cetera. That does fall under a marketing umbrella, but it's actually market understanding driving product development. So that oh. side of it, 100%. Where we get most involved and uh, thinking about it, I was thinking of this as the whole of marketing and I shouldn't have done, yeah. uh, is the outbound stuff. Yeah. It's, yeah. The, yeah. it's the brand, it's the, the influence, it, 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 mm -hmm. all yeah, important stuff. But it's got it's got to drive business at, at the end of the day. Yeah. True. Yes. And unfortunately, that that outbound portion gets just so much limelight. And um... mm. well, yeah. it's it's the limelight engine, and therefore it takes a lot of it for itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think I yeah. think this has been a great interview, and I think our last question, Chris, is who should we interview next? Cool. Right. We have a, a series, and we're really interested in talking to startups or analysts or the VC accelerator, startup ventures, hubs, you know, market uh, space about analysts and, uh, mm -hmm. and startups. And we'd love to hear any suggestions you have about who we can talk to. Um, I'd recommend the people at Two Pairs uh, in, in London. Uh, they run startup workshops uh, and have an understanding of marketing and understanding of PR, but also an understanding of what startups need. Oh, um, interesting. So uh, 
uh, the people there. Um, I think um, the the people that came to the analyst business from a different direction. So I'm thinking of some of the analysts at Redmonk, for example, mm. uh, Rachel, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just name um, off the top of my head, but uh, uh, coming to coming to this industry and therefore getting a different perspective on the purpose that we serve and delivering against that purpose. Uh, I think that would be really important. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I'll stick with two. But um, two is great. Those are great suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. We'll follow no up. Problem. Super. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you so much, John, for for spending your time with us today. Um, really good. This was a really good conversation, as always. And, yeah. Um, I mean, I just mentioned if anyone does have any follow-up questions, um, I'm J O W N O on Twitter. If uh, if that still exists this time. Yeah, we'll have your contact details in the show notes. Okay, perfect. All right, we'll make sure that people can uh, harass you. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Take care. Wow, I love this interview. Yeah, just like you said in the intro, John is so good to speak with he can go so effortlessly from a 20,000 foot overview then deep down into talking nuts and bolts and then zoom back out again and and consider some additional um contacts I think he's just brilliant he's absolutely brilliant I agree and you know what struck me again his openness and professionalism about when startups should start engaging he makes it sound like a such a natural fit yeah, a natural fit because it really is. And he, he touched um, on the important point of, of value for money as well. Okay, I, I think I know what you mean, but go yeah. ahead. <laughs> so we, we, we always uh, tell our audience that briefings are always free right. um, from a monetary perspective. But we also explain that both the vendor and the analyst are sort of paying with their time. You know, um, so as a vendor, um, yeah. if you want to be on analyst radars, um, you must make your briefings valuable for the analyst because they decide whether they spend their time listening to you or your competition. Right. And the way how you create the value is by understanding what makes a briefing relevant to the analyst research. So the information stream is primarily from the vendor to the analyst. Mm -hmm. And that's your entry ticket. Now, if you do that well, then you've enabled the analyst to ask you the questions that are key to best understand and qualify your positioning, et cetera. And these questions will need to be, will need to be framed. And all this conversation that then uh, occurs will tell you quite a bit about your product market fit, et cetera. Right. And, so and you can read into or well, because they're human, they may give you their general market views and more guiding feedback to some degree. It really depends on the individual. Yes. And then when you want deeper information, mm -hmm. say about the specific differentiation of your value proposition versus your peer products, um, et cetera, all in light of real buyer inquiries, then that creates immense value for you. I mean, value far beyond that introductory briefing, especially at the early stages um, of a startup or at important milestones, or if you, even if you want to pivot, um, all that. So it's totally sensible that such deep inquiry is then not for free. And you're paying for the analyst time because in that time, the value stream flows back primarily from the analyst to you. And that's an entirely different thing. That is a really good way to see. And I see what you mean by with value for the money. This is important. And by the way, it links back to what I mentioned earlier about the difference between first time founders and serial entrepreneurs. Exactly. Because serial entrepreneurs um, have been there before and they know the game. And although their latest startup that they now work at may be just, I don't know, three months old, uh, old, and immature, if you will, they personally know exactly what accelerates the game. Of and course. they turn to analysts sooner than inexperienced founders. As we were able to underpin with hard data in the CEO research as well. Yeah. 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 And, but actually, Robin, I also found that you made a brilliant point 
when we when we talked about the topic of sensitive information oh yes <laughs> i think that you said analysts are not journalists because analysts are not looking for the scoop that's just not their job and i thought that really nailed it you know and then john went into it a bit deeper and he explained it from the business model perspective of course and also he concluded that uh journalists exist how did he say it to to tell people tell things people things right right while analysts job is to learn and then to bring that learning back to you yeah um, yeah I, I, and that linked to your distinction between analyst relations and influencer relations which i find probably one of the the top five musts understand things about ar because it is so essential for what kind of value you get from your engagement and investment yeah or what value you leave on the table you know yeah for a pair of socks we should make that a meme on the show <laughs> yeah i love it anything for a pair of socks right <laughs> I, and i guess that that's a great conclusion for the entire episode probably <laughs> all right let's wrap it up okay i'll we'll leave it at that okay so, so so glad we had such a great valuable session with john love him and you listeners out there absolutely check out the work that gig, gig um is doing um, all their contact details are in the show and and don't ask uh, don't hesitate to ask us for help yeah yeah and we want to hear from from our listeners from you what are your views you know how are you using industry analysts or not um what are your challenges you know what are your recommendations what are your questions etc let us know um in the comments um or just simply reach out to either robin or my myself directly um yeah, yeah, absolutely do. so thank you for watching and we hope you have a great day see you soon Thank you.